Let's dive into the Word. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to John 10. But let, me just, let me just start off by telling you a story. How many of you have ever been overseas? Raise your hand. How many of you have ever been to a third world country? Raise your hand. I've been to Africa, and I'll never forget the time I was in Africa. I've been all over the world, but Africa was one of my favorite trips. We were in a third world country. It took, it took 24 hours of plane rides to get there, then an eight-hour bus ride to get to this little village called Mapumalanga. Isn't that a cool name? It's way cooler than Colombia. Mapumalanga. And in Mapumalanga, everybody runs around naked for the most part. They have no vehicles, and they live, live in huts. And I remember coming in and they had, I smell barbecue. You know, you know what it's like when you're a southern boy and you smell barbecue. It doesn't matter what country you're in, it's barbecue. You know what I'm saying? It will be all over the buffet in heaven, I'm telling you right now. And I see this barbecue pit, these guys are half naked, they're out there barbecuing. There ain't nothing better than a brother half naked barbecue. You know it's going to be good. Are you with me? Just tell me the way it is. So I go, I, I, I grab a missionary buddy, go, hey, let's go get some barbecue. He goes, no, no, Pastor, you, you don't want that. It's barbecue. And he goes, it's barbecue chicken feet. <laughs> well, barbecue, barbecue, right? Barbecue chicken feet ain't like barbecue pork butt. Okay, let me just tell you right now. There is a difference. He goes, you can't eat that. It'll kill you. So I just had to sit there and sniff it. I don't know why I told you that. Now I'm all hungry. Now you're hungry, aren't you? I'm sorry. I was in Africa, and I remember, I remember working with these children and these, these adults, and we're doing stuff, and I remember sitting there thinking... What if these people saw an iPad? What would they do? What in the world would they do if they saw my iPhone? Would they be playing video games? Would they throw it? Would they think it was demonic? And I'm sitting there wondering, what would they do if I gave them the keys to a car? They, they, all they know how to do is walk. What would they do if I said, hey, why don't you try to drive that speed to light vehicle? It's insured. What would they do? And I always wonder when I go there. Now, I don't, I, don't, I don't introduce iPads and iPhones to them or anything, but I always wonder when I go to these third world countries what they would do if you gave them something from today's modern world. What would happen if they saw it? How would they respond? Have you ever wondered about yourself how you would respond if something outrageous happened to you? Have you ever wondered if, if people in other countries think about what's happening in America? Have you ever wondered if people in other countries, third world and first world countries, wonder what you're doing today? Have you ever wondered, do they realize that there's more out there? Do those little people running around in their sackcloth looking underwear that, thank God, we don't have to wear, can I get an amen? amen. <clears throat> do you ever wonder if they think about more? If they ever think that, wow, I could go to the mall and I wouldn't have to wear this little loincloth. I could go to the mall, I could, I could wear clean clothes, I could, I could go to a laundromat. Do you ever wonder if they think about there's more out there? Let me bring it back down to our level. Do you ever wonder if there's more out there for you? Do you ever wonder if there's more to life than what you see? More than just getting up and going to work. More than just paying the bills. More than just raising children. Try to get them to 18 so that you can say you didn't kill them and they can move out. Or 30, whatever age you let them stay. Do you ever wonder if there's more than just keeping your kids alive? I don't know that. Do you ever wonder if there's more than just going to church? More than just going through the emotions of life? You know, quite often it's something I think about. I think about, God, is there more? Is there more? Is there more? Well, this month we've been unpacking this series about, about a fresh start 2013 and what it means to love God. And what it means to love people. Last week we talked about loving people. Today I want us to talk about loving life. Living life to the fullest. Living the kind of life where you don't sit in your recliner at night exhausted, wore out, beat down, and broke. Going, is there more? Talking about living the kind of life where you don't stop and look at your family life and go, there's got to be more than this. This morning, I want us to unpack this idea of what it means to love life. And if you have your Bible, it's on the screen. Or use one of the Bibles in the pew back in front of you. You can keep it if you need it. In John chapter 10, verse 10, scripture that we've heard so many times, it says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Oh, that devil. Just comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But this is Jesus talking. He says, I came that they may have life. Stop. Stop right there. I came that you can 
just live. I came so that you could just go through the emotions. I came so that you could just survive. That's what he's saying, right? Now it goes a little bit further. I came that they may have life. I came that you may have life, and read it with me, and have it abundantly. See, that, that, that's the part that gets missed so many times. So many times we skip over that part. And we think, well, the devil's trying to kill me. Jesus is trying to keep me alive. And the story of the ages. But it's more than that. Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. See, the word abundantly there is peristos. And it means in the sense of going beyond. It means super abundant. In quality, in quantity, and in superior. Advantage, beyond measure. Superfluous. I don't even know what that means. But the rest of the word sounds awesome. When Jesus says that I want you to have life and have it more abundantly, friends, let me tell you something this morning. Jesus isn't just saying, I want you to survive your bills. Jesus isn't just saying, I want you to survive your children. I want you to survive parenting. I want you to survive grandparenting. I want you to sur survive a job that you hate. You ever have those days where you wake up and you don't want to go to work? Oh, you bunch of liars. That's because half of you are retired. You're living the dream. That's exactly what it is. How many of you at some point have had a job that you hated going to in the morning? Come on now. I got my hand up. I don't always like coming up here. We have jobs that we don't love. Did Jesus mean you mean for you to live a life in a dead end job going through the emotions? No. He did. Did Jesus mean for you to just get through and hopefully have enough to retire so you don't have to depend on our great government? To take care of you the rest of your life. Is that what Jesus was hoping for? That you would just survive? No. Jesus created us to live life abundantly. Yes. And I want us to unpack this idea. See, when Jesus is telling this story, when Jesus is talking, and, and they're going to write it all down, he's talking to a group of people, and I want to put it into context. See, Jesus is talking to everybody, and in that setting you have the Pharisees. And you also have Roman guards. Let me put this into perspective. So when Jesus is talking, he's talking to a group of people that are spiritually oppressed. They've got the Pharisees telling them, well, you have to do it this way and this way. And if you do this, you're going to go to hell. And you got to do it like this. And this is how churches. And they feel this weight and this pressure of what it means to be a follower. They have this oppression on them. They have a spiritual oppression. But they also have a, 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 a physical oppression. They have this oppression from the Roman government that's suppressing them and holding them down and pushing them down. And they feel this weight. How many of you can relate to this? They feel this weight, this pressure from life. Maybe it's from the government. Maybe it's from, maybe it's from the tax collectors, the bill collectors. Maybe it's from teachers at school that are giving all this ungodly homework. Amen? <clears throat> they feel this weight, this oppression. And Jesus is in the midst of it, knowing what they're going through, looks at him and goes, hey, listen, the devil may come to kill, steal, and destroy. He wasn't just talking about the guy with the pointy horns and the, and the tail. He was talking to the Pharisees and the Romans. He was smack talking. I know your Jesus has got the poofy hair, walks on water, nothing gets out of place, and it's, hallelujah, he never talks about this. But my Jesus is a smack talking, tough man. Who looks at the Pharisees and Sadducees, and he looks at the Roman rulers and says, They come to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come so that you don't have to live under oppression. I've come that you may have life, and not just to live, but to live abundantly. Let's put it into perspective when Jesus is declaring that this morning. We like more, we want more, we want a better life. If, I, if you were to be honest with me, unless you're just a bold faced liar, which I mean, this church. <laughs> If we were to be completely honest, given the opportunity to have a nicer car, you'd take that opportunity. Oh, yes. yeah. Given the opportunity, you wouldn't mind a bigger, nicer house. Yes. Given the opportunity, you wouldn't mind having that in-ground swimming pool with a little pool boy to keep it clean. Come on, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Got to come with the pool boy. We like more. We like this mentality of having more. But let me just tell you right now, Jesus isn't talking about stuff. That's right. He's talking about carpe diem. He's talking about seizing the day. He's talking about taking hold of the opportunities you're given. This morning, what I want to do is I want to help you, if you'll allow me, 
with a couple of things that I believe biblically will help you live life to the fullest. I want you to feel encouraged today that you don't have to live life the way you're living it right now. And no matter how good life is, see, there's people in this room that would go, hey, Pastor, I got a great life, man. Things are just rolling. It's good. But can I just declare to you this morning, regardless of where you're at, there's more. God has more in store for you. So a couple of things that I believe are areas that we need to, in order to live life to the fullest. The first is friendships. Write that down. How many of you feel like you've got friends? Okay, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up if you have friends. If you don't have friends, look at their hands. They're probably friendly people. Do you know that studies tell us that if a person dies and they have one, say one, one close friend that odds are good that they lived a more fulfilled life. Now, I'm not talking about friends like Facebook friends. Okay, where you've got like 900 people and you look through your friends list and you're like, who are these people? I'm going to tell you, I friend everybody. I don't care who they are. I just friend everybody. You know why? Because it makes me feel special. Because I'm a pastor and nobody wants to be my friend. So when I, when I get on Facebook and it says, somebody wants to be your friend, I'm like, oh. They, they love me. They really love me. Just, you know that ain't true, don't you? You know, you know, just because somebody sends you a friend request doesn't mean they're gonna they're gonna be there for you when things get hard. Amen. They are gonna put a bunch of stupid stuff on your wall that makes no sense, and you're going, what? Really? They are gonna send you friend requests to help them with their farm. Some of you are like, what? Don't worry about it. Just... People that know what I'm talking about understand. <laughs> I get friendly. Wow. I'm gonna let it go. I'm just gonna give it to Jesus so it doesn't get in my heart. Studies say if we have one friend, I don't talk about Facebook friends. I'm talking about one friend. One friend that will weep with you when you're sad, that will rejoice with you when you're happy. One friend, if you have just one, and we live in this world where it's like we, we gotta have lots, we gotta have five or ten, just in case something doesn't work out, we've got a backup plan, right? But if we just have one. One close friend. <coughs> Studies say we'll be a happy person. But see, so many times we don't understand what kind of friends we're supposed to have. And I want to help you this morning in the type of friends that we need to have. One of those friends is a provoking friend. It's one of your feelings this morning. Provoking friendships. So many times in life we, we, we look for people that will just tell us what we want to hear. We, we categorize a good friend as somebody who doesn't gossip about us or, or stab us in the back or hurt our feelings. That's a good friend. It's not true. A good friend, the kind of friend that the Bible says we need is a provoking friend. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. The Bible declares right here in the scripture that we need to have friends where we're clashing. Where they challenge us. Where we say something stupid and they look at us and go, that was dumb. I know, I know that's not good preaching, but hear me now. This is good practical stuff. We need somebody in our life that will look at us and go, you're being dumb. You need to, did you hear what you, you just said? Do you see what you just spent money on? That was dumb. And it doesn't always need to be our spouse. I don't know what you're thinking, guys, and everyone. That's my wife. She tells me I'm dumb all the time. She don't count. I'm talking about a good male friend, a good female friend, depending on what you are, that will look you in the eyes and say the hard things. That will look you in the eyes and say, hey, spiritually something's off. What's up? Have you been reading your Bible? Have you been praying? Are you getting tied up in the wrong stuff? Are you making bad decisions? But unfortunately, too often, those are the people we push away. Those are the ones we don't want to be around. Those are the ones that kind of rub us wrong because... Because it hurts when somebody says it. See, when iron sharpens iron, let me declare something to you. It's painful. I, I've never made a sword. I'd like to. But I have studied how swords are made. And I know that things get really hot. And they get hit really hard. And that's what a friendship is supposed to be. The kind of friendship where things get really hot. And things get really hard. And sparks are flying. But in the end, you come out a better man or a woman. Those are the kind of friendships we need to have, but too often we run from. I want you to ask yourself, do you have a friend in your life beyond your spouse that you can honestly say is a friend that provokes you? 
This is something that will, I promise you, make for a better, happier, more abundant life. Another type of friend we need is an, need is an accountable friend. An accountable friend. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. So many times, life doesn't take a turn in a moment. Most of life's areas that get out of kilter, if you will, out of balance, are things that are small decisions that happen more and more and more and become bigger decisions, bigger choices. But Scripture tells us that if we would surround ourselves with friends, people we trust, counselors, that will hold us accountable, that we would make better decisions. Better decisions financially, better decisions spiritually, better decisions as a family. I can tell you personally, I've, I've got a friend who is, who is a uh, very provoking and a very accountable friend. And every struggle I have, he knows about. Every weakness I have, he knows about. Every chink in my armor, every weak link, this man knows about. And at any given moment, he can call me and say, Pastor, what's up? In fact, he did this week. Um, I have no problem sharing this. I use a program called Covenant Eyes, and I encourage you to use it in your home. It's something you pay for, but it's an internet, it's an internet accountability software, and I want to protect myself from the internet. So every week, he gets a report about everything that I love. And this week, he called me. I think, I think uh, White was up here with me, and he calls me and goes, uh, "Hey, Jeremy, uh, it looks like you were on Hustler.com." Oh, buddy, I was not. I immediately get on my computer. I immediately call the company. I said, I need written proof showing that I didn't do that. And they did a bunch of research, and they came back and said it was, a, it was an ad on a Christian website that was subcoded into it, and they fixed it and wiped it out, and sent a letter to me and a letter to my accountability partner showing that Pastor Jeremy did not go to Hustler.com. Can I just declare that to you? And I will print it off if anybody wants to see it. I do that because I need men of God in my life that will hold me accountable in my weakest areas, in my strongest areas, that I want a man that will look me in the eyes and call me on the phone and say, what are you doing? Amen. That is how you live life to the fullest because what would happen without it is decisions would be made that shouldn't be made. Lines would be crossed that shouldn't be crossed. And what happens is, is years down the road, you're looking at your life going, how did I get here? Because Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where there is no guidance, people fall. That's right. Friends, let me ask you this morning: Do you have friendships where there's accountability? <coughs> Another thing that we need in order to have an abundant life, and this is going to be tough for some of you. Number two is fun. Come on, say fun with me. Fun. Oh, come on, say it like you like having fun. fun. This may mess with some of you, but let me let me just tell you right now. If you're a Christian, be it's okay to have fun. It's okay. It's okay. You know, there's a time in the, the Christian world where uh, fun was considered a no no. Some of you here are probably old enough that you remember. Where if you went into a movie theater, you were condemned to hell. You could not go to a skating rink because I think Will's going in a circle will condemn you to hell, which I don't know what's going to happen to all the masculine drivers. You couldn't, have, you couldn't wear makeup. Oh, Lord, you can't wear makeup. You're going to help. You cannot have fun. I remember I, uh, I built a, uh, a youth facility, a quarter million dollar youth facility, and it had a, uh, I put pool tables in and video game consoles. And the, the building inspector who used to go to that church came in and he's just, <laughs> I go, what's so funny? He goes, you got pool tables. And I go, is that bad? Can we do that? He laughed and goes, well, when I went to church here, you go to hell for playing pool, and now there's two pool tables in the church. I don't know, well, by golly, don't tell anybody. It's okay to have fun. It's okay to do things that are fun and holy, but fun. It is okay to do things that are fun, friends. Let me, let me make sure you hear me. I'm going to say it one more time. It is okay to have fun. I was on a trampoline acting like an 18-year-old moron with a bunch of teenagers kicking them in the air, seeing who could flip. I, fun. Yes. Stupid, but fun. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. It's okay to watch comedy. It's okay to have a good time. 
Okay, I know some of you are like, Pastor, I just don't know. I think I should just be holy and prayerful all the time. And I just can't smile because good God, what would people think? Ecclesiastes 3.13. Also, that everyone should eat and drink. Oh, thank you, Jesus. See, right there. It's okay to like your food. You don't have to eat nasty food, praise God. And that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. Are y'all ready? This is the best part. This is God's gift. This is God's gift to man. Friends, let me tell you something. God gave you a gift because he knew that you'd work your tail off. God gave you a gift because he knew teenagers and children would make you want to pull your hair out. God gave you a gift because he knew work would be hard, school would be hard, life would be hard. He gave you a gift to enjoy life. Let me tell you something. People that, people that don't enjoy life, people that don't take time to have fun are miserable people. They work all day, they sleep, and that's it. I was that person. There was a, a number of years in our ministry where I was bivocational, and that means I was working two jobs, a church job and a secular job, and I was working upwards of 100 hours a week for about a year. No, no, it was six months, six months, I'm sorry. For six months, I worked about 100 hours a week, and I never did anything fun just for me, and it almost killed me. I started getting ulcers, started having panic attacks, started feeling overwhelmed, like, oh my gosh, I just, it's work, 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 where's the fun? And my wife and I decided to make a commitment that we would have fun. Started playing golf. Started riding dirt bikes. Started shooting guns. Let me tell you, that's fun. I'm not supposed to say that anymore. Let, let me, let me, I know how you people are. Maybe I started praying. I just read my Bible 14 hours a day. I just fasted for 90 days at a time with water. Guys, you got to take time to have fun. You want to live life to, a, to its abundance? Then do what the scriptures say. Take time to have fun. If you're working, Take a sick day. Some of you look sick right now. Take a sick day. Go have fun. Go do something that makes you feel like a kid again. Enjoy the life. Enjoy the breath that God has given you and bring Him glory by taking hold of the gift and having fun. Amen. How many of you would feel offended if, if you gave me a gift and I just went, Pleh, on your gift? Pleh, stupid gift. That's what we do to God. We get so busy with our toil, to toil and we get so busy with our work and our life that he gives us a gift and we just go, I'm taking time off. I'm not going to do it. I'm just too busy. You're not too busy. You want to live life to abundance, take some time to have fun, amen? Yeah. Let me just, just a little caveat right there. Let me tell you, there is a difference between refreshing and relaxing. Yeah. Okay? When you're spiritually drained, you need to refresh in the presence of God. But there's still times that you need to relax and go play some golf. Or go, go do whatever it is that you do. There is a difference. Don't expect to be, become spiritually filled by doing something relaxing. You have to refresh yourself in the presence of God. Amen. Friends, I'm trying to help you this morning. Is that okay? Are you with me? Yes. I, know, I know this isn't fire and brimstone stuff, but I'm trying to give you some practical tools to make it help us to love life the way God intended us to love life. The next thing we need to do, number three, is freedom. Oh, hallelujah. We like talking about freedom. Yeah. Psalms 116 verse 8 says, For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. God has given us freedom. Amen? Amen. But what exactly has God given us freedom from? See, the reality is there's, there's people in this room right now as we speak that you are in bondage. You're in bondage emotionally. You're in bondage spiritually. There's, there's something that's happened in your past that you can't let go of. And that's what I want us to talk about for just a moment. That, that one of the things that God wants to give us freedom from is freedom from bondage, friends. Freedom from bondage. Freedom from the addiction that may be holding you. There's people in this room that you're struggling with pornography. There's people in this room that you're struggling with depression. There's people in this room that are struggling with eating disorders. Let me tell you something this morning. You want to live life to the abundance, you've got to walk in freedom. You've got to get out of it. You can't live life while you've got the monkey on your back. You can't live life while you've got the millstone on your neck weighing you down. You can't live the life that God intended you to live while there's bondage. Amen? Amen. Pastor, what am I supposed to do? First off, give it to God and get some help. Did you hear what I said? Because we missed that. Give it to God and get some help. 
Quit sitting in your soaking in your room, in your home when nobody else is around, struggling with a bondage. Maybe, maybe you're under the bondage of, of, a, of a narcotic. Maybe you're here and you're smoking. Pastor, will smoking send you to hell? Not necessarily, but it'll make you smell like it. But it's still bondage. It's bondage. Some of you here, you're addicted to weird things. Some of you are addicted to, to, to caffeine. Wow. Oh, back up now, preacher. Well, what are we talking about? Coffee and coke. What is the house of God? You better shut your mouth. Okay, I'm going to step on this lightly so I don't get stoned, okay? Some of you are addicted to caffeine. And it's making your body feel horrible. It's bondage. Give it to God. Get some help. Well, where do I get help? First thing we talked about. Friendships. Somebody that will hold you accountable. Another thing that God wants us to have freedom from is guilt. See, there's people in this room, and I, I know it because I've talked to many of you. There's people in this room that you've been molested as a child. There's people in this room that have been raped. There's people in this room that you've done things in your past that you can't get out of your mind. I'm going to be honest with you. Can I be vulnerable? Is that cool? I mean, you, if, if you don't think less of me by now, I don't know what else to tell you, you know? When I'm worshiping, when I get up to preach, that's when the enemy tries to remind me of everything I've done. All the stupid things, all the ways I've hurt people. I used to be a very violent person. The ways that I would hurt people. I think about all the dumb things that I looked at, all the dumb things that I partook of. And I think about it, and, and there's this guilt that comes over me. Let me tell you something. When you're under guilt, you can't love life. You can't wake up in the morning excited because you feel about what you've done the night before, the week before, maybe 20 years ago. You want to live life abundantly? You want to live life the way God intended you to live life? Then you've got to have freedom from the guilt. You've got to have freedom from the past. You've got to have freedom from the things that you remind yourself of. When you give it to Jesus, your past is wiped away. He doesn't remember. But the problem is, we still do. We still remember the things that we said. We still remember the things that we did. Yes. Don't we? And what happens is that we remind ourselves. We need freedom from that. We need to remind ourselves that Jesus has set us free. Amen? Amen. There's, a, there's a saying I love. It says, no man in this world attains freedom from any slavery except by the entrance into some higher servitude. There is no such thing as an entirely free man conceivable. Phillips Brooks said that. There's no such thing as an entirely free man. You know why? Because we put ourselves into bondage. Jesus sets you free. Jesus wipes away your past. Jesus makes you a new person. But sometimes we need freedom from ourselves. Amen. Sometimes we need to let it go. Yes. Sometimes we need to forgive ourselves. I know that's hitting many of you this morning. I just want you to hear me one, one last time. Jesus has forgiven you. You've got to forgive yourself. Amen. Let, go of the, let go of the guilt. Let go of the oppression. Let go of the bondage. Another thing that we need if we're going to live life to the abundance, if we're going to live life to the fullest, is faith. Now, I'm not talking about my wife because you can't have her. She's mine. Pay good money for her. You've got to have faith. A life without faith is not a life worth living, friends. I was reading online the other day, and I, and I read this blog where a claim was made that Christians live longer than non-Christians. That's a bunch of malarkey. I'm going to tell you something that may hurt your feelings. But Christians have to die too, you know. Amen. Everybody wants to get to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. I remember going into the hospital one time and this sweet, dear woman of God in, uh, in, in Michigan. She, I said, what are we praying for, sweetie? She goes, pray that God will take me home and I will die. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Can I just tell you the first time a pastor has to pray that somebody dies? It's weird. Because usually you're thinking, well, I wish they would just die. But you never say it out loud. You know what I mean? Okay, never mind. <laughs> Y'all don't think like that, dude. Just me. Bunch of holy people. Let me tell you something. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're going to live longer. <laughs> just because you pray that prayer doesn't mean God goes, oh, I'm going to give them five more years. Praise God. They made a fresh start today. You know what? They dressed up nice at church. Let's make it 10. That's not how it works, but I can tell you this. Without a doubt in my mind, 100% guarantee that the people that live life by faith 100% will live a more fulfilled life than those that live by faith 99%. 
See, so many times we sell out to God. We pray a prayer. Maybe for you it's recent. Maybe it was a long time ago. You prayed this prayer that Jesus come into my life. But you played a game. You only gave him 99%. It was, Jesus, I'll give you my heart, but I'm going to hold this part back. Let me declare to you this morning. You cannot love God 99%. Right. It's all or nothing. Amen. It's everything. Amen. Jesus wants us to fall in love with him. And if you want to live a life to its fullest, you got to have faith. Yeah. you got to have faith that God's got the best for you. You've got to have faith that He can have every part of your heart. He can have everything that you, He's got everything in store for you. He's got it all taken care of. You've given Him everything. Not 99%, not 98%, not 99.5%. The most miserable people. Hear me. Your pastor's telling you the truth. The most miserable people in the world are the people that only live for God half-heartedly. The most miserable people are the ones that are giving them 99% and they try to play the game on Sunday, but then they're, they're feeling miserable and they don't feel like a Christian. They hate God during the week and they're fighting it tooth and nail. Let me declare something to you this morning. You can't love God 99%. It will kill you. It will kill you. When I first started in ministry, I, I had somebody stupid tell me that I needed, I needed to be somebody different in the pulpit. I needed to be somebody that everybody thinks is holy and just hangs out with God all the time. And I tried that for a little while and it about killed me. Because that's not who I am. I'm a person that struggles like you. I'm a person that has fights just like you. I'm a person that gets in an argument with my wife just like you. I'm a, I'm a person that wants to drop kick my kids sometimes just like you. And I decided a long time ago I'm not going to play this 99% game. Who I am is who I am. Because when we try to be two different people, it'll kill us. You want to live life to the abundance. Be the same person here as you are at work. Amen. Yeah. Be the same person here as you are at home. Right. Be the same person here as you're in the car going to find somewhere to eat after church. Be the same person. Lastly, you really want to find life and life to the abundance. I think this is one of the biggest keys in my opinion. It's being fruitful. Fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, two things. First, knowing your purpose. The most miserable people in the world are people that don't know what their purpose is. They don't know why God created them. They don't, they don't understand it. They think they're just living life. There's people in this room right now that you have no idea why you're still on earth. You just assume because well, I haven't died yet. Jesus hasn't taken me home. There's people in this room right now, you have no clue as to why you woke up this morning. And when you live a life where you wonder, why did God create me? When you live a life where you're wondering, why am I even, why do I even exist? Why did I wake up? Why am I going through the things I'm going through? When you don't know, let me tell you something, you will be miserable. You won't have life to the abundance. You will have a life that you go through the emotion. But when you know why God has created you, when you know what your purpose is, it all makes sense. Friends, let me tell you something. I know why God created me. I know why I woke up this morning. I know why He's going to let me wake up tomorrow morning. I know why I'm here. But I wasn't always there. There was a time and season in my life where I thought that I was just supposed to make a lot of money. I was supposed to work hard and provide for a family one day. Have education and everything else. But I was miserable. It was miserable. It was miserable not knowing why. Why I was truly created. The friends, let me tell you something. Something changed. I believe that God wants you to know. Right here. God wants you to know. God wants you to know. God wants you to know why you were created. But beyond that, He wants you to live out your purpose. Amen. Living out your purpose. That's fruitfulness. It breaks my heart. I've talked to more people than I can count over the years. People that will say, Pastor, I felt, like, I felt like I was called into ministry, but I never took the step. People that said, Pastor, I felt like I was supposed to be a missionary, but I never took the step. People that say, I was supposed to marry somebody, but I never did. I was supposed to fight for my marriage, but I never did. I was supposed to have children, or I was supposed to go here, or go there, or do whatever. It's one thing to know what God's called you to do. It's another thing to live it. There's people in this room that I believe that God's called you, created you, and you don't know what you're created for. It's 
Something specific. Something special. Something beyond just getting up and doing life, tending the garden, making sure the grass is greener than the neighbors. More than just working to buy toys and living life. More than just getting up in the morning and going to school. More than just getting up in the morning and going to work. I believe we're here and we want to know. But there's so many people here that know but are afraid to live. Thousands of candles can be lit from one single candle. And the life of a candle will not be short. Happiness never decreases by being shared. What we think we become. You know who said that? Buddha. Buddha said it. Not the fat guy with all the arms, but like we wrote about Buddha back in the day. Pastor, why in the world would you quote Buddha from the pulpit? Because if a Buddhist can get this concept of living life at peace and joy and in fulfillment and fullness, how much more should we who know the living Jesus live life to the fullest, to share life? <clears throat> how much more should we? Yes, amen. There's things that we're going to be doing as a church. Not, not right now. <laughs> A lot of people wonder, you know, Pastor, when you share all that vision at the business meeting, does that mean it like happens this week? No, that stuff takes time. It takes a little time. The Sunday school change happens immediately. This, this Sunday was our last Sunday school. And we're revamping all of our children's ministry so that our children are being heavily educated and taught and loved on during Sunday school, during church time. So we're making those changes there, but as of next Sunday, there's no more Sunday school. And at some point, not, not now, but at some point, we're going to start doing life groups on Sunday nights. We've got to train leaders and get all that ready. Why are you doing that, Pastor? Because I believe we're supposed to love life. Amen. And you can't love life while you're sitting at home, sulking in your room, miserable, right. wondering your purpose. We're going to spend time living life together. And you're going to hear more and more about that, and I can't wait to share more about that. But it's more than just saying, come on, church, we're supposed to live life. We're going we're gonna to show what that looks like by doing life together. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm done. I went over and I 